low today, and we're live, Madam Chair. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Thank you. So we've already called our meeting to order. Cap uh, Council Ramsey has put in a uh, motion to approve our agenda. I'm assuming, Councilor Deputy Mayor, you're good? Yes. Thank you. Any declarations of conflict of interest? No. Not seeing any. Can I get approval of our minutes from February the 16th? Sure. Moved, seconded. Thank you. Any business arising from those minutes? You know. No. Perfect. So we'll just wait for Mike Cochran to get back online, and he's going to provide us with an update on the 2022 cruise season. So if you want, Madam Chair, you can continue on until he comes back on, then we'll go back to him if you wish. So you want me to start and then cut Wayne off if I have to? Are you comfortable with that? Oh, here he is. Uh, though he's back on, Madam Chair. Yep, yeah, exactly. So we'll just wait. There you go. We've actually gone live now, Mike, so we are actually in official business. So we'll let you get your screen shared. I'm going to hope this works this time. Oh, look at that. I think it's working. Uh, let's try this. There. You're good. Can you all see that? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So I'll start off, and if I can go to full screen here. So it's exciting to kind of welcome back Cruise to 2022. I just wanted to give you, uh, as I kind of <clears throat> give you an update from Port Charlottetown and who we are as the Atlantic Canada Cruise Association um, that I've been, I, I got the envious task of kind of jumping into that chairman's role for the next two years of this association of four provinces in Atlantic Canada. So we're preparing to welcome back Cruise. And I'm just going to, if you can indulge me for a few minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of background so um, that you may or may not be aware. So we are basically Cruise Atlantic Canada, a regional partnership of tourism and cruise ship interests in each of the four Atlantic provinces, as well as the Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency and Parks Canada. And, you know, we want to share Atlantic Canada and promote our destination to the rest of the world. Um, basically, the cruise industry we have kind of a couple of different routes. So the Canada New England circuit is made up of three, four and seven day round trip cruises originating in Northeastern ports such as Boston and New York City. And typically they do about two, sometimes three calls in the Canada region in the New England ports. The other side of the region is the transatlantic and their cruises repositioning from mainly Europe to North America, primarily the Caribbean and they will call on several Canadian and North American ports as well. So the home ports of what we see uh, in transatlantic ports are below their list in Montreal, Quebec, Quebec City, Boston in New York, and Cape Liberty in Baltimore, Maryland are the other major ports that we take advantage of the itinerary and have the itinerary destination in between those major home ports. The source market, 72% Canada, or 11% Canadian, 72 US, 11 Europe, and 6% other. Um, so basically critical dialogue, I mean, we've been engaged with a lot of dialogue with all the leaders and welcome the opportunity to present to people like yourselves to talk about the resumption of cruise. So I wanted to just give you a quick state of the industry in terms of putting people first. And this is kind of how the cruise has resumed safely around the world since really January of 20 or July of 2020. But in, you know, just looking back over the last couple of years, um, the cruise industry did an immediate response voluntarily suspending cruise back way back when in January, I think it feels like a lifetime ago now, but two years ago, but anyway, they suspended their complete operations worldwide, which is great. And then they focused on crew repatriation, which is about a hundred thousand crew members that they had to get through borders and restrictions all over the world. And it's taken them months to do that. So I don't have to spend too much time on that. But anyway, at the end of the day, during the pandemic, the cruise industry really focused on health and safety. They engaged a lot of experts of insights and guidance and scientists from former retired executives of the CDC to come up with a series of enhanced protocols to help resume cruise safely around the world. So I guess I think key points are where we're headed. Uh, to be honest with you. So cruise operations have been resuming around the world really since July of 2020, the height of the pandemic. 
and to date more than 30 countries have reopened the cruise. Uh, Canada and Australia were some of the last ones to reopen the cruise around the world and Canada obviously put out a notice back in November of 21 to that they would be welcoming crews uh, back then and that was after significant efforts from not only Port Charlottetown but as a, a group of port operators from coast to coast. <clears throat> So as of today, we have a lot of ocean-going cruise lines sailing today with some of the highest levels of COVID mitigation of any industry involved in tourism. Um, this is primarily a safe restart mode and the mitigation measures that they have put in place have done it successfully around the world. So they're leading the way in terms of stringent and health safety measures. They incorporate such thing as testing, vaccination, screening, sanitize, I can go on and on, sanitization, enhanced ventilation to 100% outside air, physical distancing, et cetera, et cetera. We will get back to, by the end of really this summer, we expect to see between up to 100% of the ocean going fleet back in operation by, I'm guessing it's gonna be July, if not the earlier. Right now we have about 80% of all ocean going vessels back in operation. So it's going to, it's a reactive, things are moving forward and are progressing very well. We would re be remiss to say that the demand for cruising does remain strong, as we see about 82% of cruisers saying they plan to cruise again. In addition to that, 62% say they're open to cruising with an increase of 9% since 2020. So it's going to rebound and it will rebound actually fairly quickly as we start to open up. Now the resumption of cruise is putting people back to work and contributing to the global economic recovery, which I'll get into in a minute. But the cruise industry, the protocols are unique and their approach to monitoring COVID-19 to detect and respond is unique in every, uh, in every industry, but as well as every cruise line. And the protocols encompass the entirety of the cruise experience. So that is prior about 72 hours prior to embarkation, through the journey, through onboard procedures, through shore excursion responses, to back on board, screening, testing, vaccination, isolation areas, quarantine areas, they take it very seriously. And over 100 ships have returned to the U.S. waters, carrying near there more than 1 million people in the United States since July of 2021. So some of the other key points I just wanted to touch on for, for, your, for your interest is that um, something that is not necessarily reported a lot is that the cruise industry is the only industry in the world especially not only in U.S., but also in the world, in the tourism sector, that is requiring vaccination and testing for crew and guests. So 100% testing for crew and guests. Vaccination rates on board a cruise ship are typically upwards of 95%. And you'll say, what about the other 5%? Well, those are primarily for children who are unvaccinated at this particular point, like the you know uh, families and as that eases and we get new vaccines for younger populations, you'll see that increase. And typically, you know, uh, vaccination rates, they're 62% in the U.S., close to above 80% in Canada, and on board, you'll see it higher than 95%. So the mitigation to the communities is pretty, uh, is, is, is reduced significantly. The cruise industry also administers 10 times more, or, or actually 21 times the rate of testing in the United States, nearly 10 million tests per week. For cruising which is real it's a it's a it's an amazing feat that they actually do this and we wanted to show that the latest data has significantly lower rates of occurrence of COVID-19 um, than on shore so with the higher rates of testing so Royal Caribbean I'll just take for an example Royal Caribbean since June of 2021 which is just about six months ago I welcomed it's probably more than that now but this was as of late January, February, they had about 1.1 million guests on board a ship since um, starting up in North America since June of 2021. They have reported 1,745 cases, a positivity rate of 0.02%. And of those, 41 needed hospitalization, which was like a 0.0004% of the 1.1 million guests. And they've been affected with either mild symptoms or uh, even though the variant's more contagious as we're all experiencing in Charlottetown right now. So um, Transport Canada is one area that we've been dealing primarily with over the last two years is transport and the Public Health Agency of Canada, the federal uh, regulatory agencies. And they've come out that 
all eligible and crew must be fully vaccinated by approved PHAC vaccine to operate in Canada. They're, they, they're allowing us limited medical and religious exemptions like you, you're woefully aware of and under 12 exempt until a vaccine for children is approved. And employees at all port authorities um, who work on, on board or work at the port, no different than the city of Charlottetown, must be fully vaccinated. So with that, I'm trying to fly through this because I know your time is very critical. So if I, I'll leave for a few minutes at the end, but I wanted to kind of run through the the formula for health and safety that has been so successful in the cruise industry over the last year and a half. So number one, they do significant testing. You have to do testing prior to getting on board right now. So a pre-embarkation test, whether it's a PCR 72 hours out or an antigen test one day before operating on board, as well as they do screening when you're on board. And then if you do have COVID-19, you go into isolation and quarantine areas on board the ship where staterooms have been uh, retrofitted uh, for that sort of environment. While on board, again, just the safety factors of sanitation and ventilation. You will notice for those, anybody with mechanical engineering backgrounds that a lot of, a lot of buildings have mechanical systems that provide uh, mixed fresh air, uh, whereas the cruise industry have retrofitted their vessels for 100% outside air intake to really exchange the air more properly and reduce the spread of the Omicron virus. Variant. So the outbreak response is every cruise line has a COVID-19 management plan that is shared with uh, each port and community they visit. And then if there's any requirements for COVID-19 evacuation and or uh, quarantining and or ship, there's contingency planning and execution are put in place. And while in port, of course, we have also rigorous controls for destination and excursion planning mitigations for risk for crew members while they import for the crew safety. And I would say that cruise lines do not want to bring COVID-19 on board their vessels, nor do they want to bring COVID-19 to their communities, nor do they want to take COVID-19 from their communities and bring it back on board the ship. So it is a two-way dialogue. So the supply chain, this is very important just to show kind of the economics of what the impacts are. I'll show the cruise ship in the middle. If you can see my cursor there circling to the right, Marine services, which is everything from local representatives, shoreside logistics, retrofit upgrades, crew support services, labor service providers such as fuel, provisioning, um, food and drink, deliveries, muscle, seafood, etc. cetera. Um, accommodations post, that's more for the home porting scenario for people who travel to a home port in order to get to a cruise uh, point of embarkation or debarkation. The federal government is part of the Conversation dialogue that we've been having with Transport, PHAC, as well as Canada Border Services Agency, as well as the provincial authorities through Dr. Morrison's office locally, and now through the municipality. Uh, the Port Authority, it's us on one side, and we handle a lot of operations, safety and security, and the cruise terminal port logistics. There's also the cruise lines, passengers, and the crew, and obviously the travel agents that they book through. But on the community side, you'll notice there's shore excursion providers in our region. It would be Coach Atlantic, uh, Ambassador Tours, and Experience PEI. Excuse me, I just cancel that. Um, and the attraction, such as Parks Canada, uh, Green Gables, etc. And uh, so that's the score churches and places where they go to visit while they're in town. And obviously the downtown court. So some of the these are three major organizations that we've been a part of since the start of the pandemic. We formed a, an association across the country of every cruise port in Canada to advocate for the safe resumption of cruise. We've also created a national cruise committee at the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, which has been very key in terms of advocating for the safe return of the cruise. And also CLIA, which is the Cruise Lines International Association that has been involved with that dialogue. All three of us together formed that partnership to have conversation with Transport and PHAC to ensure the safe resumption of cruise is done appropriately. And we spent two years really educating Transport Canada on how cruise operates and giving them confidence measures that it can and will return successfully. So working together, I'm just going to highlight this that federal. This is where we have been for the last two years. Provincial, again, we are working with our, port of, our health authorities here through uh, Ryan Neal and a few others at the province. Regional co co coordination and collaboration is obviously because we are itinerary map 
from coast to coast, we had to have interprovincial co cooperation as well as uh, regional participation from the ports and all representatives on the cruise circuit. <clears throat> the municipal side, and our Laura was uh, thankfully available to take part in some of our cruise liaison stakeholder meetings that we've had in uh, December, and she is also part of our liaison committee. And that's at the municipal level. And of course, today I wanted to bring this presentation to you so you can educate the remainder of council. So throughput in Atlantic Canada, quickly, our forecast will go right to the end of the slide in 2022. This is Atlantic Canada, all four ports of St. John, Halifax, Sydney, and Cornerbrook. Our forecast is in the 900,000 visitation for the region, which is pretty impressive. If you look at the last two regions, we're still probably forecasting a little ahead of 2019 if everything comes according to oil. That's at our capacity. We expect it to be, you know, around that range. So global economic impact, this is the impact of cruise overall. Uh, it's a $30 million, basically 30 million passengers. and has about a $50 billion impact in wages. It supports 1.16 million jobs and a billion, $154 billion total output worldwide. It's a massive industry. Economically in Canada, in 2019, with 3 million passengers cruised, 1.4 billion in wages, 30,000 jobs, and a $4.3 billion input. So you can see why we've been working very diligently to get crews back into our region. Uh, Canada-wise, or Atlantic Canada-wise, we would have, in 2019, eight, over 800,000 passengers, a 52% increase over 2016. And these numbers are very important. Because if you look at the percentage increase, I'm going to show you PEI in just two seconds. So in Atlantic Canada, $95 million in wages, over 2,000 jobs, and 300, close to $350 million economic input spread around the four provinces. Now, the majority of crews, of course, is in, uh, in Atlantic, in Port St. John, and Halifax is the prime uh, cruise destination, and Charlottetown is up and coming. So I will show you that in Charlottetown, we received 128,000 passengers, which is a 94% increase over 2016 numbers, as opposed to 52% in the other regions. We're supporting close to $12 million in wages and close to 300 jobs with the over an economic input of over $42 million. And the economic input, you will notice, is an 85% increase over 2016. So it's very important to our region. And... Um, and we look forward to getting it back in 2022. Our first cruise vessel is scheduled to arrive on April the 22nd. And that is my presentation. And I am, I know it's quick. It's, I don't know, oh, it's uh, good. I was just 15 minute mark. Can you share that presentation? Maybe send that to Laurel and she can share that with the council. Absolutely. I just think it's got some really good information there. Yep, I will do that. Excited for some normalcy. Uh, is there any questions for Mike at this point? Council Ramsey or Deputy Mayor Cody? You good? I'm good, Julie. Okay, Jason. I'm good, Julie. Thank you. Mike, thank you very much. We will make sure that all of Council gets a copy of that, and of course they can reach out if they have any specific questions that they would like to discuss for sure. No problem. Sorry, it took me. It was. I know it's a lot of you information. You did amazing. Sorry. You were cool. right in your 20-minute circle. Yeah, Laurel had me on the clock there. She was trying to leave the room. <laughs> That's so. the women in us. Thank yeah, you very I, I, much. I, I, all right. Here, thanks so much. Have a good day. Thank Take you. Okay, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Okay. So, Wayne, the economic development report is up first, if you want to provide that update. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a few um, updates on, under uh, economic development. Um, our team um, uh, assisted with the Stand for Ukraine rally, which was held on uh, February 27th. It started at City Hall with a rally, then proceeded with a march um, down uh, Queen Street to the uh, waterfront. Great participation, uh, very emotional event, as I'm sure you can uh, appreciate. Um, I recently had a meeting uh, with Downtown Charlottetown, Inc., and um, obviously we're still coming through the pandemic. Uh, but there's some really uh, some good positives about the downtown and I'm not going to get them today but Don Allen has requested uh, to come on to our next committee uh, agenda um, and she will provide an update on the state of the downtown uh, for our committee. 
Um, have a meeting uh, next week, a reconnect meeting again with the innovation PEI team uh, with a number of members of their uh, team to get caught up on uh, some files. Um, wrapping up, um, we just finished wrapping up the final documentation for the microeconomic development summit, which was hosted back in the fall. We were waiting on the final minutes and uh, some other documentation. So Charlotte has gotten that out to all uh, participants. Work has commenced on the downtown uh, parking parking strategy review. You may recall the last couple of meetings, there's been uh, questions, Councilor Twill had a question around uh, parking. So this committee is to work. It's being led through the Public Works Department under Scott Adams. Uh, DCI is involved. Uh, I believe the Chamber's involved. Um, I will uh, be involved for the time being and uh, members of the business community um, are involved as well. Um, there's a number of things that would happen under this review. Um, some highlights would be things like rates and parking zones, mapping of the downtown hotspots, um, et cetera. So the work will continue on that. And when it's um, in its final stages are complete, there will be a copy brought forward uh, to this committee uh, or shared with this committee from Public Works. Um, Recent great news uh, for Charlottetown's bioscience sector with the NACOA announcement of $3.835 million investment for training and manufacturing and the Chamber's uh, economic uh, development recovery series continues. I recently had the opportunity um, to um, listen to the Honorable Jeanette Pettipa, who is the minister responsible for NACOA, and uh, Mayor Brown recently um, participated in the question answer um, session as well. So that's a quick a few highlights on uh, economic development. Thank you. Before we go to questions, Cindy, could you just make a note to make sure that we add Don Allen to our next agenda and maybe send out an invite to make sure she's good? Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Kevin, any questions on the economic development update at this point? No, I'm good. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, you're good? Okay. I'm you're okay, Jay? Sorry. Okay. If you have a question, though, just jump yes. in. Oh. Yes. Yes, I'm okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Laura, I'm going to get you to do the tourism and culture. Oh, no. sorry. Yeah. You had a question? Oh. No, I think he's okay. We're good. He's okay? Okay. okay. Just couldn't hear. I just didn't want to miss it if he did. Thank you. Okay, Laura, I'll get you to do the Tourism and Cultural Report. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Wayne's going to go into a, a bit more detail on these items during his uh, event management report, but um, Charlotte and I have been, um, since our last meeting, playing a pretty big support role on um, a number of event attraction initiatives that are currently underway some of which have already been announced and I'll let him talk about that in more detail and, and some which are great announcements still to come. Um, as we mentioned during uh, the, as Council Ramsey mentioned during the council report uh, earlier this month, Tourism PEI has recently unveiled a new strategy that will guide the tourism industry through um, this year as well as next year. So the strategy essentially outlines three objectives. So it's optimizing recovery potential in this current tourism season, um, setting in motion conditions that are going to support higher tourism revenues over the next two years, and then also um, taking a look at fundamentally shifting how tourism is developed and delivered beyond 2023. So our staff are currently taking some time to go through that new um, strategy and review it against our own existing policies um, just to see where we align. Uh, in addition to that, YYG Charlottetown Airport has recently made several exciting new flight announcements. So it's nice to see some positive news coming out of the airport um, after the impacts we've seen as a result of the pandemic. Um, Flair Airlines has announced two new routes uh, to Ottawa and Kitchener-Waterloo that are gonna begin um, in early June. And early July, we also have uh, Swoop has announced flights to Toronto and Hamilton. So this is in addition to um, the Swoop flights through to Edmonton that were previously announced, as well as the Toronto flights on Flair that are currently operating. So that's great news for the airport. Um, Air Canada and WestJet are also starting to increase their service to the destination. So it's nice to see things moving back to 
more regular levels of service. Um, as Mike mentioned, first cruise ship we're expecting is on April 22nd. We're expecting 72 ships in total before the season wraps up in early November. Um, something that I just wanted to add to his presentation, which he has sent me, so I'll circulate after the meeting, is that um, from Council's perspective, we know that we've seen the last couple of years as the tourism season starts to ramp up, that's when kind of some of the local anxiety starts to become apparent with just an influx of people to, um, to the city. So it is going to be important for you to be familiar with the increased level of um, public health initiatives that are currently being undertaken on those cruise lines. So if you do have residents emailing you with concern over cruise resuming, that you can reassure them that it's actually more stringent in terms of public health restrictions and requirements to be on a cruise ship right now than it really is to be anywhere else in Canada or the U.S. Um, so that's an important point to note if you do receive any communication from residents on that topic. Um, Canadian Capital Cities recently hosted the fourth installment of its virtual speaker series. So the topic was on placemaking. We had speakers that presented on that in terms of uh, long-term planning, Indigenous place naming, and making good cities great. The recording for that session is now available. We did have some pretty strong interest from the City Corporation. So if you didn't get to attend and you would like to take a look um, at that session on your own time, let me know and I'll forward through the recording. Uh, planning is now underway for the Gold Cup Parade, which is scheduled for August the 19th, and this year will be the 60th anniversary. Uh, we've also begun the hiring process with HR for our Visitor Information Center staff, which is a step in the right direction. And lastly, we just continue to work with finance on adjustments to uh, the 22-23 operational budget for our area as required. And other than that, I'll hand it back to the chair for any questions. Thank you, Laurel. Great report. I'm sure it's clear. Jason or, or Deputy Mayor Sowery, uh, no, Council Ramsey, you're good? Yeah. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much, Laurel. Wayne, you are now D E F G H I J N K. So I'm not going to keep coming back. You can re if you could just introduce which report you're going into so that people are on track. Thank you. Okay. So first I'll give the event management update and then I'll ask Cindy to share the, uh, the report. So the, the quick event management update of a few items. Um, this first one I had sent to the committee, but I just wanted to uh, publicly uh, congratulate and say uh, thank you to James Tingley, the uh, general manager at the Delta Prince Edward, who is retiring uh, next month. Um, his replacement, Adam Clark, who is an Islander, uh, will take over in early um, April. James will sure to be... Uh, Missed. Uh, he's been heavily involved in the tourism industry and is also currently the uh, chair of meetings and conventions PEI. So, uh, wish him well on his uh, his retirement. Um, it seems that we're moving in a, in a normal direction in many ways. A lot of things are coming at us uh, uh, quickly. Uh, many many active files in our area, and I'm not going to touch on all of them, but uh, just to say that we are our heads down and um, and at it. Uh, recently um, participated in two uh, attraction missions uh, into Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia. Um, the market is really heating up in terms of uh, attraction and competitiveness. Uh, I'm currently uh, on a, a, a mission right now, a Canada Games mission, with two other Canada Games staff uh, in a multi-city uh, stop with respect to a best practices mission we're doing with respect to the uh, cultural celebrations and the Canada, um, Canada Games. The Canada Games file itself um, is very, very um, active and will continue to be. Uh, while not the responsibility of this committee, I will say as a board member of both East Link Center and the Bell Line Center that the infrastructure projects are coming along very nicely that the city is funding as well as uh, Canada Games um, host society. Um, GM Events Inc. Uh, is work on phase five of our vision for growth for sport tourism, which will take us from 2022 to 2025. Uh, the committee would be familiar with this organization from past uh, dealings and heard presentations, etc. So this will help guide us and it'll tie into the overall strategy uh, that is uh, being carried out currently through um, uh, City Corporation. The Sport PEI Awards uh, are next week. 
on uh, March 31st. Uh, the city, through our, our SCORE, Sport Tourism Initiative, is the presenting partner. We're also uh, the sponsor of the uh, event of the year. Uh, Mayor Brown will present that award and have an opportunity to speak at the awards, which are on the main stage of Confederation Center uh, of the Arts. So we're very happy about that. Uh, returning to um, events, uh, in-person events is well underway. You may have seen an announcement that's gone out. Uh, we have four signature events to kind of kickstart us um, next week, or sorry, later this week. It's a big, big week for us. We have the University Sport um, Women's National Hockey Championship. Uh, we have the Canadian uh, Colleges Athletic Association Women's National Volleyball Championship. Later this month, we have the Canadian Folk Music Awards. And in early April, we have the Youth Pan Am Pan American Archery Championship Selection Camp. So it's all cylinders filing as we, uh, firing as we return to um, event hosting. You would have seen a couple of recent announcements. Uh, we added to um, our Canadian uh, Championship for Steel Timber Sports that will now also host the 2022 Canadian uh, Trophy uh, in conjunction with the Canadian Championships. And just yesterday, we had a, a, an amazing announcement uh, with Van Gogh PEI. I hope you had the opportunity um, to check it out. The city of Charlottetown uh, led that file. It was very instrumental in locking down the deal. Um, having this event, um, this product in Charlottetown is a real coup. It is normally reserved for large metropolitan cities. If you go look at the schedule, you'll see Vancouver, Toronto, Ottawa, Philadelphia, New York, and now you see Charlottetown. So we're quite pleased about this. It'll get us great media attention and it'll be a strategic travel trip uh, motivator. And then finally, we're working with many, many annual events uh, and CPHO with respect to the upcoming summer season, which is going to be very busy. More announcements to come as well. So, Cindy, if you can start to share the reports, I will go through them. So um, the first report uh, is the organizational review bylaw inventory. Uh, members of the committee may be aware um, that there's an organizational review currently underway. And uh, we've been asked, all departments have been asked uh, by the deputy CAO to review the existing bylaws to, to ensure appropriate tracking and updating and renewal to ensure things are in order. There are three uh, bylaws that fall to the responsibility of our committee. Uh, you've gone by it, Cindy. Cindy, back up, please. Right here, three bylaws, uh, the business improvement area bylaw, the transient traders bylaw, and the tourism accommodation levy uh, bylaw. So staff uh, have commenced the process of reviewing these bylaws and will report back to uh, the committee at a meeting in the near future. Are there any questions or comments uh, from the committee on this particular exercise? I think these are pretty straightforward, Wayne. I don't think there's going to be, you know, unless there's updates to something that staff feels is important to us. Yeah, well, when we bring them back, we'll highlight any uh, cleanups that we've made or any changes. Um, just want to make you aware that that is um, happening. We're a big bylaw committee. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next invite item is related to Invest in Canada, and this is simply information sharing, no action um, required. Recently, um, Invest in Canada released report for foreign domestic investment inflows for 2021. Uh, it's a great news story all around. I encourage you to take the opportunity um, to not only read the report, but to read the attached um, um, I encourage you to read my report, but to read the attached Invest Canada report uh, that is is uh, part of this uh, document. Um, some great news in here and some great uh, takeaways, especially coming through the pandemic. Um, so the next one is supporting the emerging needs in PEI's immigrant community. Uh, in 2022, the committee may recall that I've had an item to the committee um, in the past from URSA. Um, they've continued their work on this particular file in conjunction with the PEI Immigration Partnership, uh, conducting surveys and carrying out consultation uh, processes. Um, there's a document attached 
um, and a one-page summary uh, to the full report. It gives you an overview of some of the needs and wants and desires of the newcomers community, but also some of the challenges that they face uh, as we come through the back end of the, uh, the pandemic. I'm not going to go through the reports in, uh, in detail, but there is some valuable information here and um, some information that the city certainly should uh, take an interest in. There are some things that we can impact directly and we continue to work with the um, URSA with respect to how we can best assist uh, them with, uh, with uh, the newcomer community at large. Hey, Cindy. There's lots of re reading and there will be a tutorial uh, and a test later on, so ensure that you read this in-depth documentation. I want to say I appreciated re receiving that, and I did read through the newcomer document, and I found it very interesting, actually, more my job that I do in school, too, just to kind of see what their, where their concerns were. It's interesting, so thank you. Okay. Um, the next one is related to festivals, major events, Canada fame. Again, information uh, sharing no action required. Um, FAME recently submitted a brief uh, to the Government of Canada as part of the pre-budget consultations, saving festivals and events. Some great traction has been had the last two years of uh, this organization in terms of lobbying for the festivals and events sector and the importance of it to economic development and tourism um, in our country. Um, and in support of the efforts, uh, Mayor Brown sent a letter on behalf of um, FAME and Charlottetown, the City of Charlottetown as a member to MP Sean Casey, amongst others, a copy of that letter is attached, and there was a campaign uh, issued on that right across the country, so we're happy to support um, as the past um, efforts have transpired into some great investment into the festivals and events sector. Uh, next up is Sport Tourism Matters. Again, information sharing, no action requirement. Uh, Grant McDonald, um, who is GM Events Inc. Um, and current Chief Operating Officer of Sport Tourism Canada, recently penned uh, a blog uh, which has substantial national reach on uh, sport tourism and why sport tourism matters. Um, and it just reinforces why our city is capitalizing on this lucrative and competitive market. And as I mentioned a short time ago, Grant is also leading the City of Charlottetown's uh, SCORE Phase 5 Sport Tourism guide, Guidelines for Growth 2020 through 2 through 2025. So again, some more um, reading. Next up is the 2022 Working uh, Master Signature Event Schedule. Uh, information sharing, no action required. As you know, we maintain a master schedule of the events that are happening in the city. Uh, the past couple of years have been very challenging with dates moving, events coming and going and being rescheduled, etc. We provided you with uh, a working copy of the schedule as we best know it today. This will change uh, in uh, a number of ways um, as we continue to move forward. There will also be a number of events added uh, with upcoming announcements of uh, several events for Charlottetown. And just want to keep you in the loop. What's not in this particular document is the meeting and convention schedule. Um, it's currently coming together with the return to meetings and convention sector, and we will provide that at a later date. Uh, up next is the 2023 Canada Winter Games uh, Partner Initiatives. Again, for the most part, it's information sharing and no action required. So as an elevated uh, partner of the Canada Games, um, the city's obviously strongly encouraged and authorized to fully endorse the official partner designation and trademarks of the Games. Um, the Games logo, a lot of efforts gone into it, um, several core elements and guiding principles designed to create this. Um, and it's the voice of the Games and look and feel of the Games. A year ago, this past January, I participated in a session to help create some uh, communications and wording around the games, their messaging, their vision, and so on and so forth. There's two ad attached documents. It's meant of a source of uh, creative inspiration for us as a partner as we assist with dividing, designing and producing um, a communications uh, strategy for the games with respect to our partnership. Can you just come back down, Sydney, please, to the report? 
it, just right here. Yeah. Um, funding uh, partners are permitted to place their logo in conjunction with the Canada Games brand on a number of platforms and marketing areas and have a strong presence. Um, we've worked as a team to create um, an example of what we would look to do um, as a municipality. We've done this in the last time that we hosted the Canada Games um, as well. If you could just advance, Cindy, please. So you can see a list of uh, items here with projected dates um, and lead departments. We'll work with a number of other uh, municipal departments in order to carry these out. Most of them are pretty um, straightforward. And again, something that we've done when we hosted the last um, games, uh, we have budgeted for this in the current um, budget. And uh, we will work, work closely with communications as well on the, uh, on the rollout. Uh, the one item on here that we would send um, to the HR committee is the creation of a city volunteer program. So last time when the city was a partner in hosting the games, HR created a volunteer um, policy that if you, you know, volunteered so many hours as a city employee that you may get, um, you know, up to four hours off a, a scheduled work day to, to do that, to commit to the games. Uh, but we'll send that back to the HR committee with respect to having a look at that and considering that. And in addition to this, we've attached several examples of how the logo and partnership logos would look on a variety of options, such as city vehicles, on clothing that could be wore, on dress down on uh, Friday days, on the windows, um, on the front of City Hall. And I'm sure what else is in here? Keep rolling, Cindy. We could use a web banner on our website. Um, so I just want to give you um, a few examples. And, and again, we'll conduct this from an op operational perspective. But if there's any um, input from the um, members of the committee, we'd certainly take it into consideration. Is there any comments on this particular item? No. OK. Thank you. The last slide here, you'll see it coming up a drawing um, in the cultural festival on the waterfront. Uh, we will have an activation zone as a partner. So this is a concept of what our area um, could or may look like. It'll be built around Charlie Town. I'll have Adirondack chairs and fire pits, hopefully um, some giveaways like hot chocolates, photo opportunities with Charlie Town, uh, et cetera. Looks great. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Is there any questions on C to K on the information sharing? Thank you very much, Wayne. That was great report. Um, we are going to, I think we're going to need a motion to move into closed session as per section 119.1 subsection E of the Municipal Government, Government Act to discuss matters still under consideration. And because there won't be any resolutions, Peter, I'm assuming we can um, adjourn from closed session. Can we? Uh, that's uh, that uh, that's correct. We would have to go into close, Madam Chair. Once we're done the close, then we would just move in the open and adjourn, adjourn at that point. Oh, you do have to come back to open for that. Okay, that's fine. But so. unfortunately, with the connection, we will not be able to to connect back to YouTube. Uh, but we will just come out and go into a um, to a closed okay. session. Perfect. Well, for all those people watching, this will be our sign off to get into. Closed session. Thank you. So we'll move to closed session. Uh, can I have a motion to move to closed session? Councilor Ramsey, Deputy Mayor, you're good? Yes. Okay, we'll move to closed session. Thank you. Okay, stand by, please.